the Snow Queen in Seven Stories. Here we return with story number four, The Prince and the Princess, by Hans Christian Andersen. Gerda was compelled to rest again. Then there came hopping across the snow, just opposite the spot where she was sitting, a great crow. This crow stopped a long time to look at her, nodding its head. Now it said, Ka! Ka! Good day! Good day! It could not pronounce better, but it felt friendly towards the little girl, and asked where she was going all alone in the wide world. The word alone, Gerda understood very well, and felt how much it expressed. And she told the crow the whole story of her life and fortunes, and asked if it had not seen Kay. And the crow nodded very gravely and said, That may be! That may be! What? Do you think so? cried the little girl, and nearly pressed the crow to death she kissed it so. Gently! Gently! said the crow. I think I know. I believe it may be little Kay, but he has certainly forgotten you with the princess. Does he live with a princess? asked Gerda. Yes, listen, said the crow, but it is so difficult for me to speak your language. If you know the girl's language, I can tell it much better. No, I never learned it, said Gerda, but my grandmother understood it and could speak the language too. I only wish I had learned it. It doesn't matter, said the crow, but it will go badly. And then the crow told her what it knew. In the country in which we now are lives a princess who is quite wonderfully clever. But then she read all the newspapers in the world and has forgotten them again. She is so clever. Lately she was sitting on the throne and that's not so as pleasant an experience as is generally supposed. And she began to sing a song, and it was just, Why should I not marry yet? You see, there was something in that, said the crow. And so she wanted to marry, but she wished for a husband who could answer when he was spoken to, not one who only stood and looked handsome, for that is wearisome. And so she had all her maids of honor summoned. When they heard her intention, they were very glad. I like that, said they. I thought the very same thing the other day. You may be sure every word I am telling you is true, added the crow. I have a tame sweetheart who goes about freely in the castle. She told me everything. Of course, the sweetheart was a crow. For one crow always finds out another, and the birds of a feather flock together. Newspapers are published directly with a border of hearts in the princess's initials. One could read in them that every young man who was good-looking might come to the castle and speak with the princess. And him who spoke so that one could hear that he was at home there, and who spoke best, the princess would choose as her husband. Yes, yes, said the crow. You may believe me. It's as true as I said here. Young men came frolicking in. It was a great crowding and much running to and fro. But no one succeeded the first or second day. They could all speak well when they were out on the streets. When they entered the palace gates and saw the guards standing in their silver lace and went up the staircase and saw the lackeys with their golden liveries and the great lighted halls, they became confused. And when they stood before the throne itself, on which the princess sat, they could do nothing but repeat the last word she had spoken. And then she did not care to hear her own words again. It was just as if the people in there had taken some narcotic and fallen asleep till they got into the street again, for not till then were they able to speak. 
There stood a whole row of them, from the town gate to the palace gate. I went out myself to see it, said the crow. They were hungry and thirsty, but in the palace they did not receive so much as a glass of lukewarm water. A few out of them did not, er, a few of the wisest had brought bread and butter with them, but they would not share with their neighbors, for they thought, let him look hungry and the princess won't have him. But Kay, little Kay, asked Gerda, when did he come? Was he among the crowd? Wait, wait, we're just coming to him. It was on the third day that there came a little personage, a horse and carriage, walking quite merrily up to the castle. His eyes sparkled like yours. He had fine long hair, but his clothes were shabby. That was Kay, cried Gerda rejoicingly. Oh, then I have found him. And she clapped her hands. He had a little knapsack on his back, observed the crow. No, that must certainly have been a sledge, said Gerda, for he went away with a, a sledge. That may well be, said the crow. I did not look at it very closely. But this much I know from my tame sweetheart, that when he passed under the palace gate and saw the lifeguards in silver and mounted the staircase and saw the lackeys in gold, he was not in the least embarrassed. He nodded and said to them, Must be tedious work standing on the stairs. I'd rather go in. The halls shone full of lights, privy counselors and excellencies walking about with bare feet, carried golden vessels. Anyone might have become solemn, and his boots creaked most noisily, but he was not embarrassed. That certainly is Kay cried Gerda. He had new boots on. I've heard them creak in grandmother's rooms. Yes, certainly they creaked, resumed the crow. And he went boldly to the princess herself, who sat on a pearl that was as big as a spinning wheel. And all the maids of honor with their attendants, and the attendants' attendants, and all the cavaliers with their followers, and the followers of their followers, who themselves kept a page apiece, were standing around, and the nearer they stood to the door, the prouder they looked. The followers, followers, pages, who were always wit and slippers, could hardly be looked at, so proudly did they stand in the doorway. That must be terrible, faltered little Gerda. And yet Kay won the princess? If I had not been a crow, I would have married her myself, notwithstanding that I am engaged. They had say you spoke as well as I can when I speak the crow's language. I heard that from my tame sweetheart. He was merry and agreeable. He had not come to marry, but only to hear the wisdom of the princess. He approved of her, and she of him. Oh, yes, that was certainly was Kay, said Gerda. He was so clever. He could do mental arithmetic up to fractions. Oh, would you lead me to the castle, too? That's easily said, replied the crow. But how are we to manage it? I'll talk it over with my tame sweetheart, but she can probably advise us. For this, I must tell you, a little girl like yourself will never get leave to go completely in. Yes, I shall get leave, said Gerda. When Kay hears I'm there, he'll come out directly and bring me in. Wait yonder for me at the greeting, said the crow, and it wagged its head and flew away. It was already late in the evening when the crow came back. Rex, Rex, it said. I'm to greet you kindly from my sweetheart. Here's half a loaf for you. She took it from the kitchen. There's plenty of bread, dear. There, you must be hungry. You can't possibly get into the palace for you're barefoot, and the cards and silver and the lackeys and gold would not allow it. But don't cry. You shall go up. 
My sweetheart knows a little black back staircase that leads up to the bedroom, and she knows where to get the key. And they went into the garden, into the great avenue where one leaf was falling down after another. And when the lights were extinguished in the palace, one after the other, the crow led Gerda to a back door which stood ajar. Oh, how Gerda's heart beat with fear and longing. It was just as if she had been going to do something wicked. And yet, she only wanted to know if it was little Kay. Yes, it must be he. She thought so deeply of his clever eyes, his long hair. She could fancy she saw how he would smile as he had smiled at home when they sat among the roses. He would certainly be glad to see her. To hear what a long distance she had come for his sake. To know how sorry they had all been at home when he did not come back. Oh, what a fear. What a joy that was. Now they were in the staircase. A little lamp was burning upon a cupboard, and in the middle of the floor stood the tame crow turning her head on every side and looking at Gerda, who curtsied as her grandmother had taught her to do. My betrothed has spoken to me very favorably of you, my little lady, said the tame crow. Your history, as it may be called, is very moving. Will you take the lamp? Then I will precede you. We will go the straight way, and then we shall meet nobody. I feel as if someone were coming after us, said Gerda, as something rushed by her. It seemed like a shadow on the wall. Horses with flying manes and thin legs, hunters, and ladies and gentlemen on horseback. Those are only dreams, said the crow. They are coming to carry the high master's thoughts out hunting. It's all the better for you. For you may look more closely at them more closely in bed. But I hope when you are taken into favor and get promotion, you will show a grateful heart. Of that, uh, of that we may be sure, observed the crow from the wood. Now they came into the first hall. It was hung with rose-colored satin, and artificial flowers were worked on the walls, and here the dreams already came flitting by them, but they moved so quickly that Gerda could not see the high-born lords and ladies. Each hall was more splendid than the last. Yes, one could almost become bewildered. Now they were in the bedchamber. Here the ceiling was like a great palm tree with leaves of glass. Costly glass. And in the middle of the floor, two beds hung on the thick stalk of gold, and each of them looked like a lily. One of them was white, and in that lay the princess. The other was red, and in that Gerda was to seek little Kay. She bent one of the red leaves aside, and then she saw a little brown neck. Oh, that was Kay. She called out his name quite loud and held the lamp towards him. The dreams rushed into the room again on horseback. He awoke, turned his head, and it was not little Kay. The prince was only like him in the neck, but he was young and good-looking, and the princess looked up, blinking from the white lily, and asked who was there. Then little Gerda wept and told her whole history, and all that the crows had done for her. You poor child, said the prince and princess. And they praised the crows, and said that they were not angry with them at all, but the crows were not to do it again. However, they should be rewarded. Will you fly out free, asked the princess, or will you have fixed positions in the as the court crows, with the right to everything that is left in the kitchen? And the two crows bowed and begged for fixed positions, for they thought of their old age and said, it is good to have some provisions for one's old days, as they called them. And the prince got up out of his bed and let Gerda sleep in it, and he could do no more than that. She folded her little hands and thought, how good men and animals are. And then she shut her eyes and went quietly to sleep. All the dreams came flying in again, looking like angels, and they drew a little sledge on which Kay sat nodding. But all this was only a dream, and therefore it was gone as soon as she awoke. 
The next day, she was clothed from head to foot in velvet, and an offer was made for her that she should stay in the castle and enjoy pleasant times. But she only begged for a little carriage with a horse to draw it and a pair of little boots that when she would drive out into the world and seek Kay. And she received not only boots, but a muff likewise, and was neatly dressed. And when she was ready to depart, a coach made a pure gold stop before the door. Upon it shone a star like the coat of arms of the prince and princess. The coachman, footman, and outriders, for there were outriders too, sat on horseback with gold crowns on their heads. The prince and princess themselves helped her into the carriage and wished her all good fortune. The forest crow, who was now married, accompanied her the first three miles. He sat by Gerda's side, for he could not bear riding backwards. The other crows stood in the doorway, flapping her wings. She did not go with them, for she had suffered from a headache that had come on since she obtained a fixed position and was allowed to eat too much. The coach was lined with sugar biscuits, and in the seat there were ginger nuts and fruit. Farewell! Farewell! cried the prince and princess, and little girdle wept, and the crow wept. So they went on for the first three miles, and the crow said goodbye, and that was the heaviest parting of all. The crow flew up on a tree and beat his black wings as long as he could see the coach, which glittered like the bright sunshine. And thus ends the first, sorry, the fourth story of The Snow Queen by Hans Christian Andersen. We will meet again for the fifth story.